So I kind of moved the big system for the big picture person. And I think I'm going to start out with a little bit of terminology, and I'll start with my abuse of terminology. The last time I, I gave a talk, I had one of our agronomists tell me, they're not farmers, they're producers. So <laughs> the, I grew up in the city, so when I thought of which, which is best, guys?
and the owners were there with, with you know, kitchen knives and hunting guns and everything else, you're not going to break into that house. You're going to break into the empty house next door, right? So they don't, these cells and these poor parts of the roots are all protected just by the fact that they're even there. They don't even have to do anything except take up real estate that niche is occupied. Um, when a root is filled with these arbuscles, we call it the colonized root. And we actually measure this by looking cross sections of the root and saying, okay, is it colonized, is it colonized? And we look at the percent colonization of root length. And you might see references to that sometimes. And the, the ectos are the other kind that you really don't care that much about. They play a role in soil. They're important. But there are so many things in soil, so many different organisms that you can't could not possibly manage for everything. So what you want to do is manage for the guys that have the most impact. And these organisms have some impact on every single aspect of plant physiology. Nothing is unaffected. These guys evolved together. The, the symbiosis was a mystery when it was first discovered that it could have lasted 400 million years. There's evidence that mycorrhizal fungi helped plants colonize land. So they are designed, plants are designed to work with this symbiosis. And some, kind of the way we're breeding plants now in these high input systems is getting rid of the symbiosis, which means we'll never have sustainability if we do that. And you'll see why as I go on. These are some of the benefits of mycorrhizae. They build soil fertility. It's a pre uh, substance called um, lomalin that is a carbon-based protein, and it causes the soil to form aggregates. So if your soil doesn't have good porosity and you're not getting good infiltration, well, these are the guys that help build that, that soil quality, that porosity. Uh, those are water-stable aggregates. That stuff does not dissolve. It's glue. Uh, they also combine the smaller aggregates that other organisms create into larger aggregates. So they interact with all these other organisms and have an impact on those organisms as well. Um, this creates better water structure, better uh, soil structure, more water holding capacity. And because they have to take nutrients, you get better nutrition in your, in your uh, if you're, whether you're gonna eat it or whether you're gonna eat what eats it, <laughs> you know, you got better nutrition. They can replace harmful chemicals, eliminate nutrient runoff and leaching, and increase plant nutrient use efficiency, particularly for phosphorus, that's probably the most studied aspect. Um, they also, offer protection from all sorts of pests, including nematodes. Now this is a fungus, it's just, you know, filaments in the soil. So how are they going to defend anything against an animal? Uh, I'm going to tell you. Um, protection from diseases, in part, just through occupation. Drought resistance is conferred by them, salinity resistance. They induce earlier flowering, more flowers, more fruit, more biomass, increased yields, and sequester carbon in the soil. So they're good there for the environment, they're good for the farmer, they're good for your bottom line. They're good for your yields. They're like win, win, win. But that's a lot of planes, isn't it? <laughs> Can one organism really do all that? It's like, yes, sir, you'll grow hair, fix your teeth, and make you taller. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff, man. <laughs> the answer is no. One organism cannot do all that. It's the community and the diversity of these organisms that gives you all those benefits. You've got to have that diversity. For instance, this guy right here, might, they can all do some of those things, but they don't do it all equally well. So you might have this guy here who's an expert at the, of taking water. This guy here might be a superstar when it comes to occupying the roots and protecting them. This guy here, I can tell you that I recognize what species that is, he fins against nematodes. Yes? So we're looking at what, fungal spores? These are the spores. Yep. And in the soil, this is their, like a seed, right? In the soil, you, they're more like this, these little filaments. And they have a structure that branches very much like roots. In fact, they become an extension of the plant's root system. So they grow out from those arbuscles. The spores go into the root, they colonize, they make their arbuscles, and then they grow back out into the soil. So obviously I can't go over all of those things in one hour. I'm going to focus on the four that I think are most important to you guys as, as farmers or producers, if you prefer, um, which is increased yield, free phosphorus, drought tolerance, and biocontrol. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how that works for each of these for, for each uh, one. For increased yield, um, like we're going to do what we call a meta study. That's where you got all these scientists that are doing their own little experiments, 
and then some guy comes along and says, let's gather them all together and examine them as one set of data and see if we can make any generalizations that are true all the way across the board. So that's what they did. It's called a meta study. And they found that in general, if you can increase your colonization, on average, they found a yield increase of 23% across all management practices. The good, the bad, the other. Okay? All management practices. The bottom line is, is increased yields means more profit for farmers. How this works with the phosphorus is, here's your plant, and your plant is an expert. I mean, I can fix my car, but it's cheaper and more efficient for me to pay someone who knows what they're doing, rather than me fumbling around with it, right? So I go to an expert. And that's what this guy is. He's an expert at creating sugars for photosynthesis, right? He's turning sunlight and water and carbon dioxide into starches and types of sugars, amino acids and other substances, but it's sugar that feeds the microbial community. And the microbes, this particular group, the micro microbial fungi, are only mining the minerals. They're not, they cannot get their sugar anywhere except from the plant through that arbuscule. But the plant wants to be colonized. It creates hormones to attract the hyphae when, when the seed germinates. And when the hyphae reaches the plant's roots, it creates channels to guide them into cells because it wants the arbuscules in there. And then it creates a membrane that surrounds that arbuscule. You can see it in the picture because it's so thin it doesn't show up under a white microscope. But it's there. And they pass nutrients and information and chemicals back and forth. And that's what I communicate. And this guy is so adapted after, you know, 400 million years of working with plants, and there's usually not a shortage of plants in Mother Nature. There's always someone you can hook up with. Uh, in fact, we like to call them promiscuous. <laughs> they um, uh, have lost the ability to provide their own sugar. They don't even do it. They specialize. So they're very efficient at uptaking minerals, and the plant is very efficient at, at creating sugars, and they have a really good thing going. One of the big mysteries in science was how come this didn't degrade ever in, into total parasitism? Everything is out there for itself, right? It should. It would be great. But because this is essential, this guy regulates something essential to the fungus, and the fungus regulates something essential to the plant, the phosphorus. That's what the plant bases its decision on how much sugar to get. How much phosphorus am I getting? So it works kind of like a trade system, like, like an economy. How much should I pay for that phosphorus and sugar? When it has enough phosphorus, it pays less. But when the environment becomes stressful and there's, there's less phosphorus, it pays more. It says, I need more fungi, I need you to send more hyphen. <coughs> So it's a balanced system that way. You call that a little bit. That's your arbuscule on the far right? No, that's actually a score that I'm just oh, using to represent okay. the AMF. The arbuscule was that little thing that looked like a that's tree. That's a score, okay. You, you were looking it's at a picture of it inside, inside of a root. Yeah, that was, that was 400 times larger <laughs> than you expect. It was just a, a score. And so they have this trade system going. And then what do we do? See those money bags? That's your phosphorus. <laughs> We come in and we dump a ton of fertilizer in, right? We fertilize the hell out of the system. And then the plant says, I've got enough. It, it, the plant doesn't measure all the other benefits because in nature, for 400 million years, phosphorus is the most limiting. So everything is based on how much phosphorus it gets. And it says, I have enough phosphorus and we're doing the job of the fungus. I don't need any, so that means I'm going to stop paying for it. What happens to your fungi? <laughs> they can't live without a plant host. They're obligate symbionts. They die. Now, the spores in the, in the soil wild, just like a seed will last for a while, right? But if it never has a host, that's, that's its fate. Okay. <clears throat> Meanwhile, without these guys, you have to continue spending a lot of money on fertilizer to keep the system working. Yes? I mean, how long will those spores last in the soil? It varies a great deal, but I have kept them under refrigeration after I've chopped up the soil for honey for up to eight years. And Dowds did an experiment where he covered a large area with a black tarp and then checked to see how many no plants were allowed to grow there or how many fungi were still left in the soil. And after five years, although he saw constant de you know, decline, after five years he still had some. So without any host, that's Beyond that, you know, they start getting so scarce, your colonization levels are going to really go down. So these are all the nutrients that plants need to thrive, or most of them. And uh, I've already told you phosphorus is provided by the mycorrhiza. What other ones do you think they might provide? Want to take a guess? Okay, 
they, they put up, could, could take up calcium, it's a little different from phosphorus and sulfur, maybe zinc, go ahead. How about all of them? <laughs> all of them. That what? fungus is connected to that plant and it's <coughs> relieving any kind of nutrient stress that it possibly can. Yes. Why is moly not green? Uh, molybdenum, I didn't like that one up because I could not find an experiment where anyone tested okay. for it. Thank you. So, uh, so I just left it on there, but I suspect it probably is also provided. But I can't say it 100% for sure. Now, even though this is uh, soybeans, this is uh, 40 day old soybeans, um, and that's probably not a big crop out here. I picked this, not for the plant species, but because these results are very typical no matter what plant you use. And uh, what you see here is with and without mycorrhizae, if you have no mycorrhizae, the dry weight of your plant is about here. You have about 30% more dry weight with mycorrhizae than light gray. Copper, you don't see much, much difference with copper. Uh, copper is toxic to most fungi. Most fungicides, can, or many of them anyways, contain copper sulfate because copper is toxic. So uh, you don't see much there, but it passes, it passes a little bit more. I don't think that was significant. Uh, the zinc, three times more phosphorus, twice as much uptake. So and that's just an example of some of the, the common elements. Zinc is important because we're starting to see shortages of it in human populations because we have shortages of it in our food because we're killing these guys. <laughs> you know? right? And so the bottom line here is you save money on your chemical fertilizers and your inputs. In fact, you want to reduce your phosphorus because all the recommendations that are out there, like all the organizations that say put this much, put that much, based on how much you're going to take off, they don't take into account the organic phosphorus. All those roots in the ground rotting from your last, uh, decomposing from your last crop, those all contain phosphorus. The cell wall is actually made out of phosphorus. The DNA is made out of phosphorus. So um, the plant doesn't care which source it is. When it says I have enough, it cuts off the fungus, whether it's organic or not. Yes. When when does the applied um, well, fungicides that are being applied sometimes in corn or wheat production to the leaves? What does that do to your AMF? We have fungicides everywhere. We spray them, we coat the seeds with them, and uh, they're. Uh, I'm working on some experiments right now with a student to look at the effects. I suspect that they cause a delay in colonization, but I have not tested that yet. Um, other research has shown that that depending on the active chemical, it affects different groups of the fungi. But, there's, but spraying it on there generally will not just kill all your fungi. They're pretty pretty tolerant in general. Thank you. Oops. Okay. Uh, so drought tolerance. Now, when I first started sending these things and I said drought tolerance, how much water can something that's microscopic really take up? Think about it. Little straw, big straw, little big straw, the hyphae are smaller than root hairs. They're so tiny, they're microscopic. Try and suck on a little straw. How much water are you going to get? So I was pretty skeptical myself. I was, come on. <laughs> but there was this scientist. There it is. Uh, Lozano and Azcon, and they did this really clever experiment to figure out how much water the mycorrhizae could take up. And what they did was they put a 50 micron nesh, nesh here that was uh, too fine for the roots to get through, but the hyphae could fit through it. And they went all the way down and they injected their water at the bottom just to see how much the hyphae themselves could take up. And then they did that with two species, the Globus fasciculata and Globus deserticola. And then to make sure any differences in growth weren't because of uh, these guys were providing nutrients, they used a phosphorus fertilizer on this guy. So fertilizer, no fertilizer. It almost doesn't seem fair. You know, like, yeah, we'll see how that goes. And what they found was that Glomus fasciculatum had 150% more fresh weight than the fertilized control. <laughs> Glomus cerdicola, and yes, it came from a desert, so it's probably one of those superstars of uptaking water, 215% more fresh weight than the fertilized control. So they can actually do quite a, take quite a bit. And there's two mechanisms that work here that allow them to do this. One is the density of height. Just, they might be microscopic, but there's a lot of them out there, so that's a lot of surface area that can absorb water. But also, the way that pore spaces are utilized matters. Roots can't get into tiny pore spaces. And the surface tension of the water in, in, the, in the pore space is higher the smaller the pore space is. More of its surface is attached to something, right? More of the water surface. 
compared to the volume, so it's harder to get into those pore spaces, even if you could fit. And this is where these guys come in. They can fit into those tiny pore spaces. They are very, very skinny, tiny. The bottom line here is let me save on ground losses. And I'll tell you a little story about my uh, my mycorrhizal experiment down at the research farm. I had these plots, and I was just going to look inside, we're looking at cover crops and how they select for mycorrhizae, what species they're selecting for, and how that benefits the cash crop that comes after. So I was going to dig up these plants, these corn plants, in 30 days and look at their roots. So I told our farm manager, don't bother fertilizing them, I'm just going to look for roots. I'm not going to warm up very long. <clears throat> 30 days. And then last year, this was last year, we had that really big drought that swept the nation. And our, you could really recognize my, my plots too, because when they had been fertilized, all my plants were a little lighter green. So you could see these kind of lighter green corn and a sea of emerald corn. <laughs> so they were really making fun of my plots. <laughs> and I was like, come on, you guys. And then the farm manager says, wait, well, you better go check your plots. And I'm like, oh my God, they died. My experiment is gone. I walk out there and I'm walking through this sea of dark emerald green. And all of the leaves are curling up and everything has brown stress. And I reach my plots. So they are, but these are wide open. No sign of drought stress at all. Now, they were saying, hey, we can use all the nitrogen. They were, <laughs> weren't as dark green as everybody else, but they didn't suffer any drought stress, even in spite of being a little nitrogen deprived. And that was a real lesson. I wish I had set up that experiment to, you know, as a drought experiment, but that's not what I did. I smelled like a plant. <laughs> you know? But, uh, um, they tell you something when they were being managed for AM fungi. They were low nutrient plots to begin with. Phosphate levels were very low. And the ones that I didn't dig up had, had uh, a good yields. That wasn't enough to call it an experiment. It was just a small, a small pilot experiment. Biocontrol agents. Now, these diseases are probably more common in uh, South Dakota, right? Because I looked them up way back then, but a lot of these diseases are prevalent everywhere. And this is the short list. And look at look at it. You've got root rot. Root rot is caused by a lot of different organisms. You got it in legumes, you've got Eucerium well, you've got take all disease, you've got root rot disease complex, you've got the dampening off, stem rot, root rot, Perticillium well. And look you're probably gonna recognize even some of these pathogen groups, Fusarian. Uh, Phytophthora, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Brucillium. All of these guys and more are defended against. And part of that is just occupied territory. If I get here first, you don't get to get, to get in. You get 80, 90% root colonization. These guys have nowhere to live. Even if they get in there, there's not enough of them to do any damage that you'd even know they were there. <coughs> and your goal should never be 100% eradication because really, you will spend every cent you ever have and never win that war. It's making it not matter that matters, you know. So, nematodes. This one was, was really surprising to me. Uh, when I first started my career, I like nematodes. It's an animal. And I was looking up all the data and saying, well, we have 36% offset damage. And these experiments, you know, they really pour buckets of nematodes on these guys to, to test them uh, versus the cis nematode. And they were um, across the board in another meta study, they found on average that you got 22% reduced damage um, from your not root and cystic nematodes and 21% from your uh, stunt nematodes. And I, want, and I say this was particularly effective, the stunt nematodes, even though it's a little bit lower than that, because, and nobody knows how they did this, they killed only the females. Now, any ecologist will tell you if you want to control the population, you get rid of the females. So that was pretty amazing, and as far as I know, no one's figured out how they selected how they selected these females. Um, migrating nematodes, the plants were more than twice the size of controls. It's amazing. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about how it works, because really, how are they doing this? Uh, there is a fungus that can actually strangle nematodes, but these guys don't have that ability. Rope them, they lasso them. They, a little, they set a snare, really. It's, it's a little loop pipey, and when the nematode passes through it, it, they fill it up like a balloon, which makes it tight, tighten, and it strangles the nematode. And when they eat the nematode, they suck up its juices. <laughs> These guys can't, can't eat other things. They only uptake minerals from plants. So 
so uh, they don't have that capability. Now, all these dots represent our diversity of mycorrhizal fungi. And they, this guy can connect to this blue guy, can connect to this blue guy, they can connect to the same plants, they can connect to adjoining plants. So you find up with something that's all like the internet going on here. You get a network of these organisms interconnecting plants and interconnecting to each other, if they're the same species. Um, and then along comes your nematode. There he is. He's ferocious. He can eat your roots. And what does this guy do? He sends out a signal. He says, ah, nematodes are going to be eaten by plant genetics. <laughs> because those hype you're out there. And what he can do is take control of the plant's chemical defense and turn that on. And so this guy goes chomp, 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 and that signal goes out. But because he's connected to other plants, they get the signal too. So this plant gets a little chomped on, then it doesn't taste so good anymore. He goes on, the next plant has already got the signal. It's already activated its chemical defenses. So he doesn't bother chewing on it. He has to go further to chew on the next plant that didn't get the message. So that means instead of going through and chewing everything up on your, on your field, you're going to get a chomp here and a chomp there, and so the damage is reduced. Not eliminated, but it's substantially reduced. If you are not asking yourself this question, you have not been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked you, which would you represent? They, had, they served us some good food while I've been here. And if someone had tried to take that plate away from me and give me this instead, they wouldn't have had much luck. <laughs> if, I, if, if your parents every day fed you this, would you be healthy? If you'd grown up that way? This is how we feed our crops. They evolved on poops. This is the poop. It's delicious if you're a plant. This is what we fertilize with, right? NPK. You're not getting the complex molecules. You're not getting the carbon. It's not a well-rounded diet for the plant or the microorganisms that feed the plant. And that's why it's not as effective as using other forms of fertilization, such as manure. That doesn't mean you can't over fertilize. Um, and why this is OK, if you have a, 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 a deficiency, you should take a vitamin, right? So a little boost of chemical fertilizer doesn't hurt anything. But piling it on the way we do destroys the organisms that provide the, those nutrients to the plant. The plant rejects them. And when you remove your mycorrhizal fungi from the system, guess what? Your beneficial bacteria decline. Because your mycorrhizal fungi interacts with all those other organisms and supports them too. I was shocked when I went out of studying natural ecosystems to looking at agricultural systems. I came out of college and got a job with the USDA. And uh, this, I took this picture way back uh, my first year because I didn't know what to make of it. I was horrified. Uh, this is not a normal extraction. I run the soil through a sieve and I got all this stuff out. And see all this black stuff? <coughs> Those are dead spores. It was black and dead. Normal extractions are full of little bits of canned soil and root bits and everything else. And when you extract it, this is what prairie soil looks like, for instance. A natural ecosystem. Agricultural soil. And at first I thought, oh, there's something wrong with our research farm. This is soil from our research farm. And then I began looking at fed soil all over the country. We began bringing in soil. We had soil health clinics and we do extractions. Now, to be fair, I picked all these guys out of the background before I took the picture. Because when I took these pictures, it wasn't, I didn't have this slide in mind. It was just, what's this? I got to take a picture. And this, oh, that's just pretty. So, good. So I picked all the spores out of that. I took a picture of that, too. And that's all the spores that I could find in it. And these little tiny guys, you can ignore them. They're actually nematode eggs. And this is everything I find in 25 grams of soil. What you're looking at here is one gram of prairie soil. This is what where we used to farm used to be prairie. So this is what we had before we started the heavy chemical inputs that caused plants to reject their symbionts. And this is what we have now. That's what we've lost. Can we get all of that back? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, above ground diversity begets below ground diversity. And the only way to get it back is to put diversity back in the system. Now, we are not trying to recreate the prairie. We're trying to grow food and crops. So monoculturing is kind of the rule. But you can create diversity with cover crops. That's a boost every year. And one of the problems, one of the reasons I see so many dead spores in agricultural soil is because we don't leave things on the ground long enough. We harvest and kill the plant. That mycorrhizal fungus doesn't have the time that it would naturally have 
finish forming the spores. So what's happening is they're dying before the spore formation is complete. So you need to have some perennials in there now and then to support those guys that have longer life cycles. Their life cycle is tied to the plant's life cycle. So that soil should always be green side up. There always needs to be something alive on your soil to keep these guys going in your field. In that prairie soil sample of all those spores, fungal spores, each color or each one is a little different shape, or is that a different, different species? So these are different species, different family, different genera. They can look exactly alike though and be completely different species also. And they all contribute to your microorganizing uh, your little inside tree, what you call it, uh, That's what these guys all are. They're mycorrhizal, are muscular mycorrhizal spores. So, so uh, there are a few things in here that are not spores. That's actually a plant seed. Believe it or not, a microscopic plant seed. Orchids make microscopic plant seeds. But most of this, is, that's pretty much an egg. Uh, but most of this, most of what you're looking at here, are, are muscular microbial spores. And that's the kind of diversity you see in them, just in their spores. And for a while, we used to think we could tell them apart from their spores. But then once we got the molecular tools under, under our belt, we began to realize, uh, these guys aren't really the same thing. So there's a lot more of them out there. We've only described 200 of them so far. We know that there's way more going on than what we've been able to detect. So um, I'm going to go back to that increased yield slide where they found that, 20, that, that you get a yield increase of 23% across all management practices if you could increase your root colonization. So root colonization is the key here. So how do we increase root colonization? In their experiments, in their, their research of all those 300 or so experiments, uh, they found that inoculation increased colonization 29%. Now, this is inoculation by scientists who went out and, and grew up their own inoculant from the native soil. This is not like the products that you see on the market with mycorrhizae, which are not going to be native to your soil and probably going to die the minute you put it down. Um, that 29% increase. You got to have the right mycorrhizae. Turn and fallow, 20%. That equals cover crops. Green side up, that's the rule. Reduce soil disturbance, another 7%. No-till, and there's other reasons to go no-till besides, besides what you see here, on the reduced disturbance uh, and colonization. Uh, crop rotations, the, the, there is so much variation. Uh, and this was an older study, 2005. Now we know that the rotations and cover crops that are mono crops are not gonna help you because you're after the diversity. And we didn't really have those studies at the time that they did this. So your crop rotations add some diversity, but you really need a cover crop mix. And I would say get as many species in there as you can. Okay. This picture, guess where, where this picture was taken? Southeastern Colorado. You named it. <laughs> this is your town. Well, maybe not this town, our town, but this is the Colorado picture. Um, I was in a meeting with a bunch of farmers group in uh, South Dakota. They had just aired that big story about the dust bowl on PBS, and I was talking to farmers was talking to me about it. And I made the comment to them. I said, yeah, that's what tillage will get you. And he had watched that whole series and didn't understand that tillage was the cause of all this. He said, what? Tillage? This was caused by a drought. Said, well, droughts are a natural part of the weather system. We have droughts. We have years that are too wet. And just because we don't have droughts all the time doesn't mean that, that that's not normal. It's normal to have droughts. We don't like it, but it is. And historically, droughts had occurred before, and there had not been a dust bowl before. Why? We had plowed everything up. Here's a guy plowing in good weather. Nice day. This is where your soil goes. Is that where you want it? <laughs> yes? Um, just uh, on... How quickly can, if you were in a cover crop situation, we're, we're droughting sometimes these cover crops out, but how quickly, if you had a 45 day growth cycle from, let's say, April 25th to May 25th, what kind of results would you get on this mycorrhizal growth in the soil from that timeline? Well, the idea is to give them time to finish their life cycle. So if you harvest everything, just leave it empty, they're not going to have a chance. Now they've had your, your previous crop too, right? right? And they can connect to the new crop. Okay. But when, when there's nothing there is when you're really gonna make a big impact. Because remember, they can 
extend their hyphae, the same species can, can connect to a lot of different species of plants. Uh, don't do the promiscuous, right? They're not even, don't you don't have that. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, you know, I have never seen a tractor not do this. <laughs> so, and, uh, soil organic matter is really important. Drought does play a role when you have a drought and you till. You're, you're gonna just combine two bad situations and do something worse. Uh, increasing the soil organic matter in your soil, uh, increasing the water holding capacity of your soil. So that you get infiltration, so that when water does arrive, it's stored. You don't want it running off the surface and carrying away. Where is the most nutritious part of your soil profile is where? Is it deep? It's the top few inches, right? That's where all the action is. That's where all the biological action is. That's where most of the nutrients are. And the last place you want to see that is running off or blowing away. So you have to have the water holding capacity in your soil. You have to build up your soil organic matter, and you do that with cover crops. Okay. Next one. And now I'll talk about the other effects of tillage besides erosion. Here's your seed. And why do we plant seeds? How come we don't just throw them out there on the surface? Well, the chickens they need soil contact. They need soil contact. So when you till, what happens to your weed seeds that are laying on the surface? You plant them, right? So, so one of the things you're doing with tillage is you're creating a weed problem. But, and then our plant grows, and these colored lines represent the hyphae that are extending the root system, and they connect. But we plant a lot of stuff, right? And they all have their little hyphae networks. And then we harvest, and the hyphae are left behind when we harvest the plant. And these networks are useful because most mycorrhizal fungi, when the spores germinate, they let's say there's a big round spore right here, it germinates and it'll go right back up through this track because this is a fast track back up to the roots. Imagine if it had to go through there a long way in between all the surfaces. It's the difference between hacking a path through the jungle with a machete and having a highway. So what do we do? We plant again. And we grow another plant. And now I've erased all the hyphae that I had just randomly drawn on there that were not in direct contact with that seed that I just randomly drawn from the picture. I said, I'm going to just erase everything that isn't connected. And just to make a point, how much soil does this seedling have available to it for nutrient uptake compared to this guy if he has no mycorrhizal hyphae to connect to, no network to interact with? That's the difference right there. This is the difference in having and not having, in tilling up and destroying that network or having it ready. And this ties directly to yield. For corn, early P determines your yield potential. How much crop will you get? Well, the plant is measuring how much phosphorus it can uptake before the five leaf stage. After that, you can dump a uh, take a truckload of phosphorus and dump it on your field and you want to increase your yield. Bit. It's already made the decision of how many kernels and how long that, that year is going to be based on how much phosphorus you got by the five leaf stage. So you need that early pea because you've got a small window of time to get as much pea as you can into that plant promote your yield potential. Okay. These lines represent breakage. When we come in and till and we break up the hyphae. So now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to erase everything that, that is still connected to the plant. And now look what you got. You just threw away your advantage when you till. You're not going to get that early pea. You know what's going to happen? Is your plant is going to say, I need more hyphae. I can't find the network. And it's going to start feeding more sugar to the fungus because it wants that network. And, and the cost of that network is going to come from the plant. Where does the fungus get all of its energy? Directly from the plant, through that arbuscule. So the plant says, where's my network? And the fungus says, it's gone, and it starts feeding it, and you've just increased the cost of the symbiosis because that extra sugar could have gone to growth, could have gone to, to more protein, more starch in your brain, could have gone to feeding other microbes. But now you've created a drain where you didn't have one before. You've made it less efficient. Right? So the outcome is, you can't manage for everything, so 
Manage for the right microbes. Manage for your microbes. Because everything else will come along if you manage for those guys. It reduces your input costs. It reduces your nutrient loss. It increases nutrient use efficiency in your plants. They increase early pea to plants. They increase yield. They provide synergistic benefits. That's a whole other talk. They even affect insects and pollinators. I didn't even get to that. Uh, and they can give you a crop even in a bad year. There is no better crop insurance than these organisms. And that's my motto. Don't work the soil, let the soil work for you. And I'll answer any other questions. Oh, wait, did I? No, that's the last one. Okay, just making sure. Okay, question back. <coughs> So when you're trying to maintain the colonies or building, is, is there a benefit to planting your your cash monoculture crop into a living cover crop versus a dead cover crop, or what's the time frame that you have there? So so your goal is to always have something living on the ground if you possibly can. That's your goal. Okay. Now as far as the timing and when to get everything in, I'm not a farmer and, and I don't presume to tell farmers how to farm. You would probably know more or learn more from talking to another farmer about which crops will get in best. Um, not all crops, of course, are bright rising, but almost everything that you grow is. Uh, the, the mustard family, that's your canola, is not mycorrhizal. But having that in the mix does not reduce your mycorrhizae at all. In fact, we found that it increases it. Why? Because competition. So these mycorrhizal fungi are out there. I've got my host plant. I'm taking care of them. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to keep my host plant alive. And now there's this non-mycorrhizal guy who's in the next door. Ah! Competition! For resources, it actually stimulates them because they want to beat that guy because he's not a host. Um, then we're talking about vertical tillage, you know, your shallow vertical tillage versus your deep tillage. What does that do in your grid that you were showing there? So, so it's a scale of damage, right? Yeah. The more you till, the worse. The less you till, the better. No till, best. Probably the deeper you till, the oh, more yeah. damage more versus damage. if you can just. Yes. Tillage in the top Deeper tillage is we're going to do more, much more damage to the, the network. Yeah. And you'll still have some delay because oh, yeah. you're talking about microscopic organisms. An inch is a long way when you're microscopic, right? <laughs> okay. So, so there'll be some delay, but not as much. We've been putting uh, mycorrhizae in our starter trials. Um, do you think that's a good way to increase the mycorrhizae in your soil? So I'm going to say yes and no. Uh, this is a tough question because there are a lot of products out there selling mycorrhizae. Most of them are one species, 90% one species. They might say we got 10 species, but 90% of what's actually in the product is rhizophagus. And I've looked at a lot of fields now, and guess what I always find? Rhizophagus. Those products are expensive, and you're probably buying mostly something you already have. They're kind of behind the research, the people who are producing the products. It's unfortunate, but what we're finding is that there's a lot of specificity. And so the chances are if it's not native to your area, to your soil, or um, it has to compete with everything that's already out there and adapted, right? It's probably not even getting into roots, which is the most likely scenario. So until that technology comes along further, um, it's probably not worth the amount of money because they're very expensive products. It's not like you're just spending a little bit to try it, right? Right. So you'd only really see benefit if your soil was completely drained and off of it. A few people say they should they see benefits, but most people say that they can't find the difference. Back there? Uh, are we able to dig up native soils and colonize or reintroduce these into our agricultural fields? Um, through like maybe some kind of tea application where we try to, you know, get get some kind of way of introducing them on a large scale back in the day. And no one, no one has <coughs> done a good job on that yet. In fact, I'm hoping at some point to, to create some that actually work. Um, maybe after the end of my contract. I'm looking for plant breeders. I think that the, the uh, <coughs> holy grail is to breed your mycorrhizal fungi in your plants to enhance the symbiosis and to get this this enslaved community of microbes that are working for the plants, so you, you don't want to get rid of that, you want to work it harder, right? But the direction the plant breeding is going is to eliminate the mycorrhizal symbiosis altogether, and that is going to eliminate any hope of sustainability, because it means you're stuck with these high input systems. Why do we have to put so much phosphorus that runs up in the ocean on our fields? Because it's such a reactive molecule that immediately the insect that hits your soil starts binding to soil particles and other things and becoming unavailable. The plants evolved to have a microbial community, that's why they exude sugars to support that community, to 
to make those nutrients available. That's how they evolve together, to work together. When, when you force that and you eliminate that, you have to flood the system with so much to get just a little bit. And how much of that expensive phosphorus do you think is actually getting into your plant? Want to take a guess? Less than 30. It's under 20. Yeah. If you get 20, you're lucky. 20%. So that's like going to the gas station and putting 20 gallons of gas in your car on a good day, you might get all 20, and putting 80 gallons in a big container, taking that baby over and driving it away after you pay for it all. That's pretty much what you're doing with your phosphorus. It's an irresponsible use of phosphorus. It's damaging the environment. It's costing you as farmers money because you're not getting your money's worth out of that phosphorus. And this phosphorus is a, it's a limited resource. Every scientist in the world knows we're going to run out. There's a lot of argument over exactly when, but I can tell you right now, at our current usage, that our domestic supply in the United States is going to run out around 2040. Give or take a few years, but that, that's, that's pretty much how much we've got left. Most of the phosphorus in the world is in Morocco, and we're going to see the same thing we saw with oil. Domestic supply is gone, what happens? Price goes up, right? Oh, it'll go up and down, but the trend is always going to go up and up. And since it's a limited resource, it's never going to come back down. It's going to keep going up until we run out. So we have to also have recycling programs uh, to help to help uh, help us not run out. Where, where are we going to be with none? Well, we're going to all be worshiping at Gabe Brown's altar. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You're talking about the specific types. Is there a specific type that you know is a good type that you really want to look for for your time to figure out what you actually have in? So the goal is to get the most diversity. So what you want are the guys you lost, but you don't know what the what you lost because they're not there anymore, right? So, so it's catch-22. Uh, inoculating the earlier question, like bringing natural soil and putting it in. How many natural areas are left compared to how much farm left there is? It's just impractical because of the scale, the scale of the problem. So we really need an industry that's providing us an effective product. And the industry isn't there yet. I think it will get there, but at this point it's not. And what you want, and that's actually harder to grow things. The reason they sell this one this one fungus is because it's really easy to grow in a greenhouse. But your field is not very much like a greenhouse. So once it gets out there, it's really not the right thing. So someone needs to create regional blends that use the native species, where they've gone out and collected soil, like he suggested, from natural areas in the area, what used to be in that area. So that will be something that can be in your soil and is adapted to your climate. Grow that up and make it available. Um, and the whole process is expensive because you can't grow in a petri dish like you can bacteria overnight, have a million of them. These guys take the whole plant cycle to grow. Some of them don't want to create spores when you put them in the, in the greenhouse. Some of them do. It's not their native environment either when you try and grow in the greenhouse. So it's tricky, it's expensive. Eventually we'll get there, but right now the best thing you can do is have good management so you don't continue losing. And birds and things can spread them by eating them <coughs> Soil, so they'll can slowly get back, but it's very slow. What was the impact on AMF with applied fertilizers like, say, a high salt nitrogen fertilizer and hydrus? Are those destructive to the AMF colony, or, or you know, just from a sheer destruction standpoint? They have a different effect than phosphorus. When you increase your nitrogen, you feed rhizobagus, it's a nitrogen lumber. And so it takes over the system and your diversity goes down. So it's it. The other guys then get starved out, and their numbers are reduced, but it's for a very different reason, but the same end result is you lose the diversity when you have too much nitrogen in your system too. But you lose everything when you have too much phosphorus. They just, they just stop accepting colonization. A little bit ago you had a slide up that showed the, a few of the different pathogens. One of them on there was a Phytopathora. Um, would you happen to have any data you would share with me on that? I just got an email this morning, a guy asking about that in walnuts. So, yeah. uh, walnut? Yeah, so, walnut trees. So walnuts associate with the ectomycorrhizae, different kind of mycorrhizae at the time, so I don't have data on those for walnuts. But you could do a literature search. If he doesn't have access to scientific journals, he can go to any university and use their library. Um, that they will let them put. So I'm sorry I don't have data. That's all right. I just thought you might have it on hand, so. But it's good. You should know that he's looking for ectos. Okay. Could you talk about the differences between phosphorus sources, like manure versus synthetic? The difference between manure and synthetic, synthetic from the plant and microbial perspective. First of all, 
One has carbon, one doesn't. One has complex molecules, one doesn't. So the natural is actually is better. For rejection of mycorrhizal fungi, the plant doesn't care. If it has a, it's only looking at phosphorus and it doesn't care about the source. If you have too much, it's gonna reject. <coughs> so there's sort of a mixed reaction there. But you, with the natural, you, you get the carbon, right? And you want to increase the carbon in your soil because that's going to increase your water volume capacity. It's also going to feed other organisms. So it, so it goes back to the vitamin plate or the nice meal uh, kind of idea. Any other questions? Yes. Does every um, tilled field will it have a mycorrhizae in it? Yes, they're, they're hard to eradicate completely. But okay, what are they living on? They're living on corn. Uh, they will associate, well, most agricultural weeds, a lot of them are in the pig weed family, so they're usually non-mycorrhizal, actually, uh, a lot of weeds. If you have mycorrhizal weeds, like grasses, that, like bologna grass or something, they, that can help support them and keep them from, from being completely starved out. Corn is really highly mycorrhizal. So one, I have a student that I'm working with who wanted to test seed, the effect of seed coatings on mycorrhizae, and he said, I'm going to use wheat, and I said, Grow all your wheat plants up for 30 days uh, in natural soil and we'll inoculate them. I have some inoculants that I had grown up. I said, we'll do both. We'll make sure we got a lot of mycorrhizae in the soil and then we'll see how responsive they are before we use them in the other experiment test so we know how much rejection or if they killed them. And what he found when he ran all 10 of those was that none of them were mycorrhizae. So we're breeding it out. How do we breed our plants? These big seed producers go to warm countries where they can get the warmest, longest season, the highest temperatures, all the water, massive inputs, they're being selected against, even if it's inadvertent, they're selecting against mycorrhizal colonization. So those genes are no longer being selected for. And we're breeding it out. And once it's gone, we'll never have to stand well Not without some sort of recycling program, but it will still be during our oceans. And, and the price of food is going to become really high if we don't do things in a more stable manner. How do sorghums compare to corn for mycorrhizal activity? Oh, when I want to grow up mycorrhizae for an inoculum for an experiment, I use sorghum. They love it. So sorghum in a rotation would be a big benefit. Sorghum is, is, is highly mycorrhizae and associates with a lot of different species and varieties. And another plant that we found that is really good is, is oat. And we looked at the mycorrhizae that colonized vetch, and I know a lot of people like vetch, but it only had like five species in it. Most other plants have, you know, a dozen species in them that are dominant. You know, we didn't, weren't exhaustive in trying to find every little copy of DNA, but the dominant species uh, and the highest number of, of, of dominant species were found in oat. And we tested oat, crimson clover, uh, wheat, and vetch in our experiment. Uh, we were actually testing molecular tools, so research in this area is slow because there aren't very many people who study mycorrhizal fungi. People who know their taxonomy and can tell them apart from the soil. There's about two dozen scientists in the world. That's not a very big pool. I mean, people breed plants. I mean, comparatively speaking, it, it's hard. Uh, so the tools have not been refined for mycorrhizal use, and that's what I've been doing for the USDA, developing ways for them to test. Uh, and identify mycorrhizal fungi in the roots, not just in the soil. What you find in the soil is not what you find in the roots. And it used to be we just collect spores and say, well, this is this is what, what's associated with the plants, but those spores, can, you can't tell if they're dead or alive or uh, what's going on, particularly if they're dark colored. You can't see if they have anything inside of them. Um, so what happened was we found out that when you collect your data based on spores, it was different than if you collect your data based on what was just in the soil using molecular techniques, which was different from what you actually found inside plant roots. So all those plants have their own selection going on, where I'm going to select these 10 or 12 species, and that's who can colonize me. And this species of plant over here selects for something else. And you don't know who's selecting for what as a farmer, right? And not that many of these species have we identified everything. And this is new research. So what can you do? You get as much diversity as you can, and no matter what you plant, you're covered. That's what you do. Um, also, you create more niches for other things. And in one experiment by a scientist named Hieronymus, he took a system and he began adding mycorrhizal species to it. And he started with one species, two species, three species, 
And everything up around 12 to 15 species began to plateau. That was like where things maximized, except early pea. Ha <laughs> ha. Pea, the phosphorus content of the plant tissue went up <coughs> to the end of this experiment, we found the plateau. I think he stopped at around 14 species. But that tells us what a difference they make. Because when you have different organisms secreting different enzymes and chemicals into the soil, it affects your bacterial and other microbes and creates new interactions. There's, we call them synergistic benefits, where uh, this, the sum of the parts is greater, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts individually. So you can do one of these things and you'll see a little benefit. And you can do two of these things and you'll see a little more benefit. But when you do them all, the benefits are maximized. And it's more than if you added up what you did individually. Because you're creating new kinds of interactions that don't exist when you only form one practice. Does that make sense? Yep. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So do we know any particular varieties of the corn wheat that are still able to form? Ah, that is research that in my opinion very badly needs to be done. Someone needs to do some broad scale testing of these varieties and publish a list for farmers online that anyone can look up and say, these are mycorrhizal varieties, these are non mycorrhizal varieties. No one has done that work. Uh, I can only say that the one variety I used in my last experiment, uh, uh, what was Everleaf or something like that, I don't really remember the name of it, but if you email me and I'll give you a card if you want my email, I'll look up the uh, name of that variety. But I think they stopped making it because we changed to a new variety and we were going to do a big field experiment with it and I said, let me test it first to make sure it's mycorrhizal. And my boss says, come on, everything's mycorrhizal. I said, nah, I don't trust it. So I cast it in anyways. And guess what? It wasn't mycorrhizal. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned there's only about two dozen of you guys. How do we go about increasing the population of you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, let me tell you, if you don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can we do as, from, as farmers to help, you know, push this? Um, to get more research, along the lines, applied research, things that you can use. That's what I try to focus on. And a lot of people do research, but it's not, it's hard to tie the relevancy to, to, to what you guys are doing. You know, they're saying, you know, you've discovered that this is a new species, but how does that help you? A lot of their research doesn't have a direct impact. So there are maybe four or five of us who study within the agricultural system and look for ways to, to use them that way. And I would say go to, if you're a member of the soybean council or a wheat council or anything, say, we want to fund research on this. Because that's, that's what it's all about. Research costs money. And uh, if you want more research, and a lot of these organizations just automatically take a, a little tithe, right, from their crops. What is it, a penny or on the bushel or something that goes to their organization, and they have research dollars. And if you tell them you want some of that to mycorrhizae, you'll see more mycorrhizae. They'll go looking for someone to do the research. They'll go to the local university and say, who have you got who can do this? And if they don't have someone, they'll, they'll contact those people who can do the study. 